Good morning and welcome, yes, welcome to today's conversation with the distinguished Uta Frith, Professor of Cognitive Development at the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience at University College London, where it's already tea time. Thank you so much, Dr. Frith, for joining us. Uh, it's an honor, an incredible honor to introduce you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me to take part in this. Well, now I hope that uh, Chris is going to show all your awards because they're yeah. impressive beyond belief. Have you got them up, Chris? I will get them up in just a moment. Okay. Yes. Because... Uh, well, what I wanted to, uh, ha, here they come, because that's impressive. And you say, Chris, there wasn't even room to put them all down. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it makes you a pioneer in the field of, of cognition, autism cognition. And I looked up the word in the dictionary, cognition, and it means the process of knowing it also means the capacity for knowing. I didn't know that before. And that's essentially what you're bringing to us. Uh, your book, Expl Autism Explaining the Enigma, goes into just exactly that. In each chapter, you bring the science of cognition to bear on the daily living limitations of autism and how the limitations affect daily living. I, I would love it if you could go into that now a little more. Okay. Um, it, it's a very kind introduction. Um, really, really nice of you. Um, I, I'm also very pleased that you, you like the idea of um, looking at thinking or, or what's going on inside the head, at cognition. For me, cognition is what the mind does. So we have the brain, we have the behavior, two things we can really observe and scientifically study and look at objectively. But in between, we have this mind, which is really, I think, what we are interested in. And what we really want to do, I think, is to know what it's like inside the mind of an autistic person. Um, how can we imagine that the world looks for them, um, how what, what what other people are like for them. So the the idea behind the book was really to try and get more inside the mind of the autistic person. Of course, it's such a big task. In no way have I done more than just scratch the surface. And um, meanwhile, but not at the time. I think when I wrote this book. Meanwhile, we have accounts from autistic people themselves who talk about how they see the world. And it is very exciting and interesting to match up what they say, uh, what our own experiences, subjective experiences tell us, and what now objective science uh, can provide and tell us about the mind and the brain and the behavior in autism. It, it's not only their behavior, but our behavior. When uh, we're social creatures, and yes. when what you and I are saying to each other, we, we look at each other and we respond to each other. Somehow, the connection between us as social creatures is somehow limited or it's skewed or it's incomplete. I think that is exactly, exactly sort of pointing to an essential difference. Um, we, we notice this when we are with autistic people. And there, is, there is something which people have often described as a wall or as a glass, uh, a sheet of glass, or as something not quite able, that they're able to penetrate. But actually, there is something in the neurotypical mind, which which always reaches out into other minds and makes amazing assumptions about what there is in this other mind and how we can influence it. And of course, these assumptions don't fit the autistic mind. And we notice this. We notice there is something very strange and difficult. 
and it is an, a, a huge task to to try and explain uh, first of all what makes us so social in this particular sense more social perhaps than other social animals but you can argue about that and what makes the lives of autistic people somewhat less social but i would want to say in no way do i think that their lives are asocial they also have um, a social world they're also influenced by others but i think in a in a rather different way and that still i think remains to be explored well yeah Yes, I see exactly what you're after, uh, and I've been down that road. I, I see a couple of things. For one thing, I see parents lose a sense of themselves. If my child doesn't know who I am, who am I? And parents lose a sense of their own identity in that block. I and think that's, yeah, that's an extremely deep observation uh, because uh, parents have to um, supply so much of the normally two-way cooperative business in the social interaction that this sense can get lost. But it is still a, a marvel to me that it is possible to do all this um, work, which normally is done separately by two people, almost by one person for two. Um, so we do see that people actually behave quite differently when they talk to autistic people. I, I am very different. I have noticed that when I saw occasional videos of myself talking to autistic people. Is that me? It, I, it's, it's me who is the odd person in such a, in such a video. It's me who, who uh, makes some sort of strenuous and strange attempts to get a conversation going, that kind of thing. Um, and, and it shows how actually um, the autistic person um, isn't behaving so strangely in that situation. It's very often... The, the other people who are behaving very strangely in this, in this social um, game, in this very reciprocal uh, interaction where in the end um, you, you just take on a lot of the job, a lot of the task on yourself and perhaps you shouldn't. And that's a difficult thing not to do. I think you're right, though, because uh, when parents lose a sense of their own identity, they feel they're no good as parents and no good as people. Oh, it is, and, it is and, so... And that's yeah. what I meet over and over, and you must meet, too. I have, from the very beginning, that I was, I was really, you know, drawn into uh, studying autism. And, and I saw parents, I, I could observe the, this extraordinary feeling of of taking the blame, of feeling guilty, of thinking they could have done something different, they've done something wrong, perhaps to to not to get this child into the normal developmental path. And from the very beginning, I said, no, no, I must tell parents that this cannot be so. It is not possible to uh, to create an autistic child just because you want to, just because you behave in a very strange way. That is just not possible. And therefore, they should not feel this sense of guilt. But you know, however uh, clear it is that we are talking about a, a, a strange biologically caused condition, it is still in ourselves to, to, to have that feeling, perhaps if we had done something different, perhaps we could have changed it, perhaps we could do something. And again, I want to say, um, yes, you can do so much, but please don't blame yourselves. Please give yourselves occasionally a pat on the back for doing so incredibly well, for doing such hard work. Yeah, and, and it is hard work, and uh, that guilt uh, that haunts mothers, there's nothing you can do with guilt. It doesn't take you anywhere, and I always think of Sodom and Gomorrah, 
when Lot and his wife fled. And Lot said to his wife, don't look back. She looked back and she was turned to a pillar of salt. Nothing but the taste of tears. Yeah, it's a very sad. It's a very and sad that's story. That's what's always seemed to me. But a story to take note of, or the story that helped me when I was young, and I thought, I am not going to turn into a pillar of salt because oh, it won't is, help either yeah. of us. Well, that's such a good motto. I like it. I think that's a very good motto. Don't look back. Don't blame yourself. Yes. Um, look forward. Look forward. And also, always with hope. This is another thing. Um, there is this idea that... Um, uh, you, you know, maybe only if you do some very intense interventions will you get some change. But actually, you will always get change, even yes. if you do nothing. Because uh, development, development itself um, brings about improvement and yes. maturation. It, it may, of course, take quite a while. You know, this is where we have to be patient. So patience is, of course, another important buzzword, isn't it? Patience and hope. And, but not looking back, not recrimination, not blame. I also feel that many uh, parents nowadays think that unless they start incredibly early with the, the child at the earliest possible age, it'll all go wrong. It will not be good enough. And again, I say, you know, the evidence that you can only have good intervention very early on and not later is not it's there. Not, it's not true. You can have yes. very, very positive effects with interventions at any age. And this is something which, again, I think should be added to the hope and to the patience kind yes. of watchwords. Um you can do things, you may not even call them intervention, just teaching, just, you know, socializing, just teaching. We teach children all the time. And also um, when, they, when they grow older and even when we are adults, we have to learn and we have to change um, to, to adapt to circumstances, to cope with adversity, that kind of thing. But that's true human beings human brains are adaptive like that and we change and the gift of change we change yes, that is all right. of us do that is right it is a and, gift and i love that change I, I i feel we mustn't let you go without first finding out about it too uh, you know tony atwood is known very well in this country uh but he learned from you and I learned from him. How did you get together? Well, How'd this is a very nice other? story. He found me, I think, as a, as a PhD student. He found me as a supervisor. And I, I so enjoyed um, working with him. He was a clinical psychologist at the time. So he wasn't like a PhD student who was only doing research. He was doing both clinical work and research and he could do it in the right setting so he was he was a marvelous student and i think he was one of the key people for me who taught me about asperger syndrome ah. um he, he may not have called it that at the time but he had a a sister-in-law i think he talks about her in his books sometimes and he um, he told me about her, lots of anecdotes, lots of ideas. And every time I met him, I think I said, please tell me more about your sister-in-law who was autistic. And yet she was a bit different from the other autistic people. She was one of these people who made us aware in the early 80s already that there was another dimension. There were. It wasn't only the the very um, uh, intellectually disabled uh, people that we should look at. That autism was a spectrum, and there were people who had no intellectual disability, like this uh, sister-in-law. 
And it was so interesting that you could still see the features of autism all present, but in a very different way, playing out in a in a in a very positive way, actually showing uh, some marvelous advantages of being autistic. Well, this reminds me of long ago in the early '60s, doing research before the name Asperger had appeared. And I had wonderful talks with a psychiatrist who taught me a great deal, and she called them sand in the machinery. Oh. She said, they are those who, who, who may be the aunt who lives upstairs but never makes connection to anybody but teaches the children French. Uh, the, the term Asperger, you introduced to this country. Um, I think I think it was it was in the air. It was in the air. It was actually Lorna Wing who first used it, and I talked to her about um, Asperger syndrome. Um, she she was the one. She was the pioneer, I think, in in teaching us all that there was this wider spectrum, and Asperger himself had this vision of the spectrum, which was quite a revelation. So my my native language is German and I could therefore read Asperger's paper in the original language and I must say it took me quite a while till I, I started reading it because Kanna was everything you know Kanna was the yes. person Kanna didn't refer to Asperger so it was no, from it other people that I learned about the existence of this it was quite difficult to get hold of this paper um, published in, in 1944, um, I, I started reading it and I thought it was going to be absolutely terrible because the first few pages were just sort of flowery prose um, about, you know, philosophy and life and, you know, everything. Actually, uh, I came to realize that this is, is nothing but the sort of typical German academic way of introducing your thesis. You had to show that you were a deep thinker and you talked about the world and everything. And then suddenly, sort of like seven or eight pages in, he starts talking about the really fascinating cases. And he's not at all flowery. He has actually an excellent, an excellent clinical description. And this was totally fascinating. So um, I, I remember that uh, some students of mine and I read this together. So with some way of, of maybe giving me giving some summary translations, I can't remember it very well. But we talked about it and said, isn't this interesting? Shouldn't we actually make this available um, to people that they can they can really read this in the original? So um Eventually, I got round to translating it. It was quite a long, difficult job for me because, of course, I'm not a not a translator. It, you know, it's something quite uh, quite different. And I, at the same time, um, thought, "Wow, if this is, could be published, wouldn't it be good to get people like Lorna Wing and other people write about their views about this?" Um, and and this is how I um, published this book, which was an edited volume with um, all those authors in at the time who had already really said, yes, there is such a thing as Asperger's syndrome and we should talk about it. And it's an interesting thing. So um, that was in 1991 when it was eventually published. And I think I had no idea that it would fall into under such fertile ground. I thought, well, you know, let's let's put it out and let's see what people make of it. But very soon it it did become it did catch on in some extraordinary way. I'm 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 still um in a way quite surprised about it. Well, I think because people recognized it. They recognized it, some of them in themselves, and then recognized it. Uh, you use the interesting phrase, mind blindness. And there yes. is a kind of mind blindness in Asperger in that rather than conversing, they tend to hold forth. Yes, there was. On uh, their favorite topic. 
Yes, there was um, there were several aspects. I think one to do with these interesting people themselves, um, but the other one had to do with Asperger saying quite um, uh, plainly there is a little bit of 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 autism in all of us, something yes. along those lines, <laughs> or uh, he, he referred to men, you know, being being like that or a scientist being like that. And of course, um, I too felt, oh yeah, I have some of this in me too. Um, this is what makes me sort of single-minded and obsessive and uh, detail obsessed and also perhaps not altogether so socially competent, not, not as competent as, as other people I knew. Um, so it was very appealing. There was almost a, a kind of idea that, um, almost a little bit of of Asperger envy. You know, you sort of, ah, there is something very special about having this syndrome. Well, very valuable for a culture uh, to have, you have to have obsession to get certain work done. So uh, the difference is relevance. I keep coming back to that. I loved, I, and I'd love to hear you talk further about fragmenting thinking. Because okay. somewhere in that is the 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 obsession uh, is geographical rather than understanding how one idea relates to another. And I I I loved your illustration in the chapter of the portrait that uh, Claudia had done of you, which I was just saying to Chris is essentially it's a landscape. It's not a portrait. <laughs> it's quite a nice way. I, I must say, I, I wish I ever looked like that. And <laughs> well, she, <laughs> she caught nothing of you. And I thought, well, she got each detail in where the islands were and how the coastline worked. But it's not I, you. I remember actually what she that she did each of the pearls of my necklace very, very yes. uh, early on in this uh, uh, she portrait. She them first. Drawing. Well, I, I can't swear to that, but she she spent a, a more time on these pearls, I think, than on most other details. And I, that was very interesting to me. And that, that was very, very nice. Uh, I, I really loved that. I, I think, you know, there is something about about having um, this attention to detail and being able just to focus on something that other people might not find so unbelievably interesting. Um, and, and yet it becomes something very special when you do focus your interest on it. So yes, there is something um, amazing about this, which I think we are still, still trying to unravel because Oh, I talked about uh, about um, maybe a fragmented world, but you know, many people have criticised this and said, "Wow, this is rather uh, negative." Um, um, I didn't mean it to be negative. I meant it to be as an image. Oh, I don't think of it. I didn't think of it as negative. Oh, good. I just thought it was oh, as, a, as an observation because I thought, "Aha, oh, good. I, okay. I'm with you on that." Oh, and it, it's confusing to other people. And the nearest I could come to is there's no sense of the relevance of one thing to another, ah, particularly yes. when it comes to ideas. That's that's, that's an interesting interpretation. I think we, we don't yet know uh, what, what relevance really is and, and how important the context is for us. I mean, yes. it's so interesting that we... Uh, we interpret every utterance in uh, differently in, in different contexts, which doesn't seem to be the autistic way. There is much more of a sticking with a more literal meaning and not being so uh, amazingly flexible in interpreting uh, one particular thing uh, against different contexts in different ways. So this has its advantages. You know, it's almost like saying, hold on, you can't just sort of turn around and, and, and interpret things according to just like you want them to in this context or in another. But hold on to certain basic rules, certain, you know, basic uh, categories and things. So that, that's an interesting, an interesting quirk of the mind. Well, I feel the more we, we spread these things out on the table, not in judgment, 
but in a, as a way to look at them. We can't look at them until we put them out in front of ourselves and say, oh, she's got the pearls down, but where are you? <laughs> uh, but uh, that is always very difficult. So we, we look for different things in pictures. Yes, yes, we do, we do. Um, I, I think um, one, one of the um, interesting reactions I had to the, to the book, um, you know, it has this, uh, this picture of uh, yes, this painting, picture. this wonderful yes. painting, which has quite a central role in the way I interpret mind blindness. I, I used it. Um, because to me, um, when I saw this painting, actually, in, in the Louvre in Paris, at the time I was writing this book, I said, look, this is exactly, exactly an example of where our um, amazing ability to uh, attribute mental states to other people, you know, even in paintings, even, you know, made up. Uh, scenes is is clear and obvious and I talked about it how we can tell a story how the painter can assume that we will follow him and his thoughts and one of the reactions I did get was from um, a wonderful autistic woman who said um, wow this this makes no sense to me at all when I see a painting I'm interested in the brush strokes in the color in the relationship of light and the dark all of the things that are really to do with with making this painting never mind this kind of story that you attribute that you make up the actual interest is that other layer is is the 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 um the materials that the painter conscious this up with so it's almost as if if you go too deeply into the story you're drawn into this you cannot see the technique anymore and that that's actually a great pity but on the other hand if you're drawn to see the details of the the brush strokes and the different kinds of colors you may miss out on maybe what you call um relevance uh the sort the of social message story. you the, lose the social story the social story it's yeah with so story. interestingly it's very difficult to have both you know we, we can't do everything <laughs> so some of us will be more interested in the stories and others well, will be more interested yes. in well, this the, is the, details. the principle uh the uncertainty principle uh it does exactly that. As soon as you look at something one way, you cannot see it the other way. Quite right. Quite right. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our time. And I just want everybody who is catching us this morning uh, to know that Dr. Frith and I are going to exchange letters um, so we can talk further. And you can pick those up. They will be on the website for you to read. And I look forward to that so much. And it's been a joy to be with you. Well, Thank you. Completely mutual. Thank you very much, Sister. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye. Are we